All right, everyone, we can go ahead and get started now, I think. Welcome to Cloud Native WebAssembly and how to use it. We've got an hour and a half here in this room, so I'm pretty excited to see what we can get done. Part of this workshop will be kind of introducing and talking about WebAssembly, its context in Cloud Native, the projects that myself uh, and Michael work on, uh, Wasm Cloud and Wasm Edge, both CNCF sandbox projects that have applied for incubating, uh, which is really exciting. And then there'll be some interactive portions in the middle of the workshop that we'll kind of run through live and you can follow along. Um, there should be nice QR codes and links for you to pull up, so please feel free to pull out your computer and, uh, and try it out yourself. Um, we have a couple of people running around the room giving out handouts and things, so if we're going through the tutorial part and you're running into an issue, uh, raise your hand if it's something that I can address for, for a bunch of folks. We have mics around the room too. They got a whole setup here, which is, which is pretty fun. Okay, without further ado, I think we can get started. So I wanted to, uh, before we go over the, the agenda and really get into today, uh, I wanted to just let us do some introductions, talk about who we are. Um, you want me to, okay. Uh, so I'm Brooks Townsend. I'm a senior software engineer at Cosmonic, but I've been working on the project uh, Wasm Cloud, which is an application runtime, application platform in the CNCF uh, for the last uh, little over four years. So I've been doing backend WebAssembly things since 2019, which is not the longest anybody's been doing it, but I've been doing it for, for quite a while. Uh, I have a passion for writing Rust code and contributing to open source projects. I came from the Kubernetes, a Kubernetes background. I worked on a platform called Critical Stack, uh, which also was open source, so my entire career has been open source things, Kubernetes, and cluster <laughs> provisioning to running WebAssembly and working on a platform. So uh, that's, uh, that's a, little bit, a little bit about me. Michael? Uh, thank you, Brooks. So, um, my name is Michael Yuan, and uh, um, I started the uh, Wasm Edge project in 2019, you know, right before the pandemic. And uh, um, at the time, we thought, you know, uh, maybe the WebAssembly on the server era has finally come. But then we were hit by the pandemic, and we can't explain to people, WebAssembly is not really web and not assembly. You know, it is, a, it is a, um, a what we call a lightweight runtime or container format that runs a new generation of applications. And that has been a really... Uh, you know, um, a long road. You know, I, my background, I came from Java, you know, so uh, 20, 20 years ago, 25 years ago when we did Java, it was a pretty straightforward thing. You know, people start adopting it and then, you know, um, it sees a lot of commercial use. But WebAssembly with the three years of co-ed, uh, that's, that's in the middle. So, you know, that uh, requires a ton of explanation and all that. But so the, the, the question that people have always asked me is that, where is a killer application? You know, you always say this technology is lightweight, it's secure, it's whatever, you know, that's, uh, you know, every time you go on stage, you talk a big game. But what is a killer application? You know, um, for the longest time, I find it's a little difficult to answer that question. But hopefully, uh, in this workshop, we're going to show you something that, uh, um, you know, at least uh, personally, I feel uh, truly proud of. And I think you're going um, to go also go home with some really interesting use cases that you can run directly on your own laptop uh, by the end of this workshop, right? So, you know, that's, so please do, um, you know, um, it's an hour and a half, but stay until the, uh, uh, the end, you know, to, 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 to do all the exercise, please. So yeah, I think uh, let's, let's go ahead and get started. So, so today we're going to start on what is WebAssembly, uh, in parentheses, abbreviated WASM. Uh, this is an intro level tutorial class, so I want to make sure we touch all the bases before we get started. We're going to talk about WASI P2 or WASI 0.2, which you may have heard of as the component model if you've heard of WebAssembly before on the server side. And then I'd love to dive into what WASM looks like in Cloud Native. It's, it's really important to make sure that we touch that base, and it's going to be both from the perspective of uh, WASM Edge as a, as a WASM runtime and WASM Cloud as an application platform, uh, both in the CNCF. We're going to do a few interactive demos slash tutorials. We're going to run through them up here while you do it. So you're going to write your first WebAssembly component based completely on WebAssembly standards and the WASI HTTP interface. And then be able to run and inspect it using, again, standard tools from the organization, the Bytecode Alliance, which is another standards body that works on WASM. And then, of course, get to run some components using, using our runtimes and platforms. 
And then at the end, once you've made your first WASM app, uh, very fun, and it's great to extend that. We're gonna go beyond that kind of hello world. Uh, Michael's gonna do a great presentation of uh, something that I think is incredible, the running LLMs locally using Wasm Edge. Um, all the code fits on a slot. Oh wait, no, sorry, I'm just spoiling it. Uh, and then distributed components using Wasm Cloud uh, and uh, adding capabilities in that way. So by the end of this tutorial, you should be able to understand WebAssembly and how it's different as a unit of compute from a container. You should be able to see how WebAssembly is a standards-driven effort from the W3C to the Bytecode Alliance to the standards within the CNCF, and you'll deploy at least three WebAssembly applications and components uh, built using standard tools running on the CNCF runtimes uh, using standard tools and practices. So let's go ahead and get on with it. So, what is WebAssembly? Can I get a quick show of hands? How many of you have heard of WebAssembly or WASM? Maybe more than just like, oh, I'm gonna go to this tutorial. Oh my God, a bunch of hands went down for that. Wait, put them back up for the, for the yeah, have you heard of it before? Okay, I got ahead of myself. How many of you have used WebAssembly before? Everybody's hand should be up. Without knowing it, you have absolutely used WebAssembly as you've been navigating around the web. So I wanna talk a little bit about the history. The high profile applications you may have heard of are like Photoshop on the web, Figma, Google Earth, Microsoft Flight Simulator. If you've watched a video on Amazon Prime on like your Roku or Apple TV or whatever, you've used WebAssembly before. So WebAssembly is all over the place, especially in uh, highly distributed or uh, highly different device or on the web uh, context, and you have absolutely used it before. So for the folks who know anything about WebAssembly, I think it'd probably be good to have the mics here. There, there are two set up here. Um, what do you know about WebAssembly? I'm gonna ask for volunteers just to say something. There's nothing, nothing too basic, but, but what do you know about WASM? Don't be shy. I know that it's WebAssembly. There you and go. And I oh. know that in theory, in a very early version, you could compile something to bytecode that would be runnable using a JavaScript-based interpreter. I think it was by Mozilla, if I'm not mistaken. Excellent, yeah. It, you can compile code to an assembly-like language and then execute it in a JavaScript interpreter. Great. Any other takers? I'm not gonna wait for you for too long. Okay, then we will, we will cover the bases. So WebAssembly originally came from Browserland. Very descriptive name, assembly code that is running in the web context. It originally came out of this desire, like, hey, we have this huge code base uh, across enterprises and, and, uh, and industries in C and C Sharp and, and other uh, uh, server-side languages that we would love to be able to reuse in the web. Uh, important things, things like encryption libraries that you don't want to re-implement in JavaScript or performance sensitive things like uh, single instruction, multiple data, make sure I don't get that wrong, like executing quicker than just JavaScript can, at least uh, unoptimized in, in a runtime. So it came from this desire to have that and in order for it to do this, in order to run code in the browser, it had to have many different things uh, to actually exist as a technology. It had to be an open and standards-driven technology. Everything that runs in the browser is driven by the W3C, so you know HTML, CSS, JavaScript. WebAssembly is the fourth language of the web that the W3C works, maintains, and, and uh, develops. It had to be completely architecture and OS agnostic. Of course, if you're running code in a browser, you can't have code that tightly t couples you to a specific architecture or a specific you know, uh, Linux API. It had to be an instruction set that wasn't tightly coupled to those platforms. It had to run in the browser. 
It had to respect the rules of the browser sandbox. You can't just have native code forking off processes and making HTTP requests on its own. It, so every single thing that a WebAssembly module, a WebAssembly binary does, it has to ask the host engine for. So if it wants to access the microphone, read something off of the page, it has to say, hey, can I please do this? It had to be a small binary. There was that really cool study from Google, uh, released the quote from a few years ago, that if your web page takes longer than three seconds to load, 50% uh, of people will just leave. So you can't be shipping a 100 meg binary around. It had to be a small binary. And because of this, it's, it's inherently polyglot. It's an instruction set. It doesn't really matter what language you write it in. Just needs to be able to compile to the WebAssembly instruction set. So that's a little bit of a background on WebAssembly. And let's move kind of forward into how we got started doing server-side WebAssembly. All of these the aspects that you hear for the, the browser land also sound great for server-side. And if you can think about uh, in any particular way, I really like this uh, slide. I feel like it represents the idea very cleanly. When you have a language, you, you write some code in, in a source language, it can be C, it can be Rust, Go, Python, JavaScript, you can use those language tool chains, some of them natively today, some of them using projects like uh, Componentize Py for Python or Jaco Componentize for JavaScript, and you compile it into a WebAssembly binary. That individual binary can run anywhere a WebAssembly runtime can run. It's not all unlike the idea of you have a container and you can execute it on a container runtime, or you have Java bytecode and you can execute it on the Java virtual machine. I know some people don't like that analogy, but I think it's pretty apt. You compile to a platform agnostic bytecode and then you can run on the virtual machine. Now those WASM runtimes, of course they started out in the browser and it's supported in all major browsers today. So you have Chrome V8, which executes JavaScript and WebAssembly, Mozilla SpiderMonkey, JavaScript and WebAssembly. Uh, it works in Safari too, also incredible. Uh, but now we also have this set of WebAssembly runtimes that works on the server side. So this is actually how uh, Michael and I, we, we all got started is say, oh, uh, we can just interpret this instruction set and execute it on a Linux box or a Mac or a Windows machine. So all of this came together and we started to take a look at the benefits of WASM, like a tiny binary size, security by default, polyglot, um, uh, uh, open and standards driven, and we were like, wait, this sounds great for server-side applications, why don't we do it there? So from there came this idea of, hey, if there's gonna be a standard for the technology, there also needs to be a standard for executing WebAssembly on the server-side. So inevitably in your application you are going to want to do things like write to standard in, standard out, uh, read from standard in, write to standard out. You're going to want to uh, access the file system, open a socket. All of these things need to, have, uh, need to happen in order for your application to run. Can you imagine what you could do, if you're a developer in the room, what, what can you do if you can't interact with the outside world at all? No databases, nobody can call you, you can do math, you can do Fibonacci, that works pretty well. But the idea is that in order for this to actually be successful, we needed a standard in order to work with uh, these common constructs and applications. So WebAssembly System Interface, aka WASI, um, has been out with WASI 0.1 for a long time. And WASI 0.2 came out this January, so just about two months ago, with a set of standard interfaces that people can build their applications on. Comes with uh, CLI, a uh, set of CLI interfaces, file system, sockets, uh, and then the more higher level one uh, for applications is HTTP. So all of these things, now that they are together, give different languages and different libraries the stable base to build WebAssembly libraries to take existing libraries and port them to WebAssembly. And so you can execute these WebAssembly components kind of similar to uh, you take, uh, similar to the container standard. It's a, it's a standard set of packaging essentially. 
And uh, the, the key thing for this to be in the standard is that we needed to uh, go through the, an open standards body process of proposing the interface, testing it, implementing it in more than one runtime. Uh, this is well battle tested within the different WebAssembly runtimes. So I mentioned the component model. And from here on, uh, for the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna refer to every WebAssembly thing as a WASM component. Uh, for all intents and purposes, I think that's pretty accurate. You can think of it as a WASM binary. But what a WASM component is comprised of, this is actually the WebAssembly text format, so very kind of human readable, but assembly-like format. That, by the way, you probably would never write. It's just what you compile to and then you can read, but uh, you surely can if you'd like to write some assembly. What an actual component or a WASM binary is comprised of is internal things, so on the direction, on the right, there are things like memories, tables, globals, all the, all the good things that you loved about your architecture class when you took it uh, or, or when you looked it up online. And the thing that really makes it special is a set of imports and exports. So everything that a component is gonna do, it has to ask the outside world to do or it has to be invoked by the, uh, by the host runtime. So this one import called logging, this could be something where you have a standard capability to log a message to some output. On the server side, we may implement this by dropping it to standard air. On the browser side, this may be implemented by outputting it to the console. So it depends on the local implementation, but you have to ask the outside host runtime to uh, use it. It's also, uh, for example, if you needed to use something from libc, like forking off a process or doing a memory allocation, all of these things are not things that are natively available. You have to ask to use them. Uh, it's worth mentioning that this is not usually the level that you program at. So you have a set of imports. You have your core module on the inside, which is dealing with memory. It's all your assembly things. And then uh, on the other side, you have exports. So these are functions that the host can call on your component. And you can think of all of this as very similar to like a foreign function interface, an FFI boundary. You're, you can call functions, it can call functions, but it's very sandboxed. And it's all done, uh, again, with a set of standard interfaces, so it works well across different platforms, different runtimes, different environments. Now, as I mentioned, WASI.2 dropped in, uh, uh, it says December, somewhere between December and January of uh, last this year. An amazing thing that came with the component model is not just this imports and exports method, or this imports and exports uh, uh, concept, it's the fact that a matching import and export can be composed together. So if you have two different components that talk on the same interface, you can have them satisfy the other. So right here I have uh, component A that's written in Rust, component B that's written in Go, and if they both talk using the same standard interface, think I wanna write uh, something to standard out, uh, and the other component can be reading from standard out, then we can compose them together and create a composed component. Now this idea is really powerful because it allows both languages to interop in a way that they may not natively do so nicely. If you've worked with a foreign function interface before, it can be pretty dicey to get that to work. Um, have you ever tried to call JavaScript from C? Maybe, but this gives it a really nice strongly typed interface to do it with. And you also get this idea of getting uh, SDKs for free. So I don't know how, mon how many of you work at a company that has an internal project, uh, or if you've worked with a client library before, you probably found the project and have been like, oh, do you wanna work with Rust or Python or uh, Node or Java? You pick your SDK and then you work with that. That whole notion of a language silo, you know, those are all separate projects at companies, like the company I used to work at, that was all uh, actually separate teams that manage the SDK, that all now becomes one SDK that's written in the language that it's best for. If you're doing data analytics, maybe it's implemented in Python. If your number one priority is interoperability with Kubernetes APIs, maybe you wrote it in Go. But when you take that and you compile it to a component where the interface is what the SDK essentially implements, then when you write your component in the language that you like to use the best, 
you can compose them together just like you would normally import in, uh, you know, bring in an SDK from, from the internet. It's a really powerful idea from composing components together. Now, if you are a security person in the room, you may be thinking, this sounds awful. Uh, I don't want to grab a random component from the interface and then link it together and give it everything that my application has, which is exactly what you're doing today, by the way, when you bring in an SDK. But with WebAssembly components, what you have is a very strong boundary between these components. So even if you link them together, nothing is actually shared. You, you don't share the same memory. Uh, you don't share the same linear memory. Both of them are still actually separate entities. You just get to call functions on the different components. So the, the, it's just called share nothing linking if you really look into the proposal. Um, but all you really need to know is that you're still communicating over a very strong uh, boundary. And this is not something that these, these function calls are not something that traverse a network. It's something that's been benchmarked and uh, these function calls happen in the, you pay essentially a, a nanosecond, excuse me, level penalty in order to do this. So this is a very fast uh, process execution. Now you may be thinking, okay, well what about the interface? What, what is this import and export that I'm actually using? So the export of a WebAssembly component is a function that you need to implement in your code. And the import is a function that you get to call. So you would import things from SDKs, and then you'll export something like an HTTP handler. And all of that is driven by WIT, which is WebAssembly interface types. This cheat sheet that's up there on the screen is the one that I was talking about. It's the one that you kind of have passed around, but is an interface definition language specifically built for WebAssembly, and there are a couple reasons why, but primarily it's so that we can have something that natively speaks the component language that we want, and we can use to generate types, bindings, functions in all of the languages that can support components. So uh, in the interfaces that you write, we would write one interface to say, hey, this is how HTTP is gonna work. And then every single language can generate those bindings using uh, either the standard uh, library, depending on the level of support, or the project called uh, WIT BindGen. And then uh, each component, no matter what language is written in, is talking over the same interface. Now the cheat sheet, uh, again, you, you won't need it today, but it goes over the, the types that are available, the, uh, the syntax, and some of the things that you can do to define functions. So talking just a little bit more about interfaces, I know you all have the handouts, but this is kind of what an interface may look like. Versions can be mixed and matched. There, there is, uh, you know, this is all really just to say that, you know, people have thought about this a little bit. We have different versions of interfaces. You can import multiple. Wasm Cloud and Wasm Edge both at least support the, the, the minimum uh, preview amount of interfaces in WASI 0.2. And uh, you can also uh, just specify very specifically the, the imports and exports for your component. And I'll go a little bit more in depth on what this specifically looks like too as you start writing the component and you look at a, a WIT file. Looking forward, just to continue to give you a little bit of context around what people have really been thinking about when they're starting on the component model. Each of these interfaces essentially come with a level of stability, uh, how much they're going to be integrated into language SDKs, and as we move forward, because these interfaces are so strongly defined, we actually have a notion of an adapter. So when there's new releases of an interface, even if they had breaking changes, you can seamlessly adapt your current application over to the new version of the interface. Now we have a set of standards, but that continues to grow. So WASI Cloud includes things like key value stores, logging, blob stores, WASI NN for neural networks, WASI Embedded for continually more embedded environments to run WebAssembly, and the new hot off the press WASI Web GPU. I would highly recommend watching the WASM Day talk uh, yesterday. I believe it was from the Intel folks who have been working on this one a lot. So this is all really just to say that there's a set of standard interfaces but there's more being proposed all the time, and you can always write your own, so this is very extensible. 
As far as language support, uh, there's very robust support for languages that can compile to like an LLVM intermediate representation, and that's a little in the weeds, but you can uh, you know, essentially go to a WASM backend from there. So Rust, C++, C are all doing great in the WebAssembly support department, uh, which is why you've probably seen so many WASM examples in Rust. JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, uh, your Ruby, your, your scripting languages are essentially adding uh, pretty solid support around taking an interpreter and then being able to run that code uh, in Wasm. And there's still definitely tooling coming out around uh, Go, uh, C sharp slash dot net. Uh, there's more languages that aren't even represented on here, uh, like Zig and Ponylang. There's a lot of things that support WebAssembly. Uh, but of course, there's too many things to, to put on a slot. So what does Wasm look like in cloud native? Uh, and I promise I'm always uh, almost done with my spiel uh, before we actually get into the good, the good workshop content. So if you take a look at the CNCF landscape, there's a pretty big representation of WebAssembly across cloud native projects. Uh, there's a ton that use this for uh, plugin models, for user defined functions, for proxy filters. Uh, there are different uh, runtimes, different engines, different orchestrators. There's tons of WASM representation across the CNCF landscape. Um, but we're here at KubeCon, and not, uh, wh what I really want to focus on is these are the projects in the CNCF that are like WebAssembly runtimes, platforms. Like this is why we're here giving you this talk today is, is because we've been running these things in a cloud native uh, context for, for a long time. So I really want to talk about uh, how that fits into uh, cloud native and how you can, you can get started there. So I'm going to go ahead and hand to Michael to talk a little bit about uh, Wasm Edge and where that uh, fits into the cloud native ecosystem. Okay. All right. So um, um, when we started the Wasm Edge project, there has been, um, like Brooke said, you know, Wasm is largely a standard, right? You know, so uh, a standard means multiple implementations. So um, when we started the Wasm Edge project, there has been multiple Wasm implementations out there, including in the browser and outside of the browser. So um, people ask, why do you want to start another project? It's because it's born from uh, some of the use cases that we see at the moment that, uh, that requires additional features. And uh, in particular, we had the notion that we want to do something that is, um, uh, that is specifically optimized for the cloud native uh, uh, landscape, meaning that's uh, it's, uh, uh, it's the common workload that's re uh, required in the cloud native space, the performance, and also the integration with Kubernetes. So what does that even mean? So uh, I know there's a wall of text, but you know, um, but I'll I'll try to explain through that, right? So um, it's so the runtime itself is written in C++, but um, the, the the most important um, uh, uh, application language on that runtime is Rust. So uh, the thing is important because um, um, as many of you know, Wasm uh, grew up with Rust. They are both Mozilla project at one point. So um, you see a lot of Wasm runtimes are re entirely written in Rust, which is nice. However, we thought at the infrastructure level, we need uh, diversity in supply chain. You know, for, if there is a critical bug that's being discovered in Rust, it may bring down all the Wasm runtimes, right? You know, so that's why um, from early on, we decided to do a C++-based project, and also because we are closer to uh, edge devices and hardware manufacturers, as today, Wasm Edge is used in, say, automobiles and in uh, factory floors and, you know, things like that. And those things uh, tend to be more friendly in their, in their um, um, you know, C++ header files and, and, and C libraries. And uh, one of the earliest things that we did is that we, fo we focus on performance. So, you know, uh, we have both AOT and, uh, um, and, and the GIT compilers. AOT stands for ahead of time compiler. So um, people um, asking us, you know, how much performance sacrifice do you have? You know, if I just compile Rust to native code versus compile Rust to Wasm, right? You know. <clears throat> We got tired of answering that question, so we wrote a paper and published it on IEEE Computer a couple of years ago. The conclusion is that in some times, compiling to Wasm is faster, okay, I repeat, faster than compiling to native. Um, the notion was so outrageous, the paper was originally rejected because the referee said, you know, the reviewer said, you, you guys must have made a mistake because what you have claimed is impossible. 
you know, that's uh, how is that possible? You compile to an intermediate format and it runs faster than compile directly to the target format, right? You know, so the reason is actually um, I think pretty um, pretty subtle and pretty interesting is that the AOT compiler compiles the WASM code to native code on the device that runs. However, when you do the so-called um, quote-unquote native cross-compilation, you typically just specify a, a generic device in that category. So for instance, if I'm compiling an application to run on, say, um, uh, uh, um, you know, an Intel x, uh, x86 device on uh, running Linux, but my compiler is on, on MacBook, I probably would specify that target and then give it like uh, the O3 compilation flag, you know, something like that. Um, in that, it typically omits all the advanced features the CPU might offer. And as we all know, the, 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 the CPU capabilities has improved uh, significantly over the past, last past, year, past couple of years. So they have things like CMD and you know, things like that. You know, there's lots of new instructions. But to, if you blindly compile to native, you typically target the lowest common denominator. However, if you uh, have a WASM AOT compiler sitting on your target device and uh, generate native code uh, from your portable WASM application, um, there's a non triple chance the, the, the code generated from that compiling process is going to be better than if you just compile to native, right? You know, so that's the, uh, the reason for that. I, I thought that was pretty interesting because, you know, uh, you, could, uh, you could say if I optimize everything, native is still faster. But the point is most developers do not optimize everything. They just say, I want to, on my Mac, I want to compile to x86, right? You know, so give me a binary. And that binary is often uh, sub-optimized. So that's, you know, um, so that's, um, at a very high level, you know, that's we, um, we um, you, you know, we are um, proud to be one of the fastest um, WASM runtimes, right? So um, then as time goes on, there's more and more use cases. Um, and uh, also, as Brooke has mentioned, there's lots of WebAssembly um, uh, standards. That's, um, you know, um, standards related to WASI with components and all that. Um, so um, we have thought that's, you know, it may not be a good idea to support all of them in a single binary runtime because that has security implementation, uh, implications and also makes the runtime very bloated. You know, the, 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 the benefit of WASM is being light, right? You know, it's being uh, very small. So why do we want to unpack all those features that we may not use? As, as we will talk about that in a minute, that as WASM being increasingly used in advanced field like AI inference, you know, which AI library, which GPU driver are you going to include with the WASM distribution becomes uh, uh, a challenge. You know, you can't just in include all of them, right? You know, so. Um, um, so uh, a couple years ago, we, we devised uh, a, a plugin architecture. So basically, the core runtime is just, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, executed the WASM application. But all the uh, operating system or the lower level um, interfaces with hardware and other drivers and the software are, can all be built into plugins. So for instance, um, in WASM Edge, you, you, want, you may want to make a HTTPS or TLS call for uh, from out, uh, external web services. Uh, in, that, uh, in order to do that, you need a, a SSL library. You need, a, a, you need uh, the crypto algorithm and all that. And we do not, by default, bundle that into WASM Edge. And instead, we have an installer option for, for users to, to install this as a plugin for users who have this particular need, right? So, you know, um, and because of that, we can, uh, I think that aligns very well with component model because each of the component model proposals uh, yeah, uh, from our end, it's now implemented as a plugin. So, you know, so we can have a large number of, uh, you know, a, a very tight uh, core runtime and a large number of um, uh, plugins, right? So we have um, a rich set of features as plugins. For instance, we have um, um, asynchronous HTTP servers, you know, because one of the early uh, server-side WASM use cases is to run it as a serverless function or microservices. Uh, if you run it as a microservice, you cannot have one incoming request that blocks the whole thread for extended period of time, right? You know, so you basically, even if you are single threaded, you have to multitask. You have to do, um, you know, um, um, you know, a context switching on that uh, on that um, uh, thread so that you do non-blocking I/O. So you know, so th this whole non-blocking I/O is uh, um, is not well defined in WASI 1.0. And uh, as Brooke mentioned, you know, the 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 true native async actually comes in WASI. Uh, version three, previous three, right? You know, by the end of this year, but you know, uh, for the um, 
of serverless use case that we have to deal with, you know, um, um, you know, we have to build those functionalities into our runtime, you know, in in a way that is, uh, um, um, I hate to use the word that is not standard, but you know, it's uh, I would say it's ahead of the standard, right? You know, it's uh, you know, it's uh, because they they would have to reach that point at some, uh, you know, because you know, I think this is a non-negotiable feature, you know, when 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 people build microservices or serverless functions. And uh, um, like I said, build the uh, TLS for HTTPS clients. And uh, you know, there's an also a, 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 a Wasm proposal called GC, you know, garbage collection. You know, this is one of the slow things because when Wasm first came out, we say we are lighter, we are better than the JVM because we don't have GC, right? You know, because you know, our front end language is Rust. You know, the, the memory problem is being solved by the compiler. So you know, there's, we, know, we have no need for for runtime uh, memory man active management uh, memory management like that, but as more languages started to target Wasm, especially JVM class la languages. So, for instance, you know one of the um, a strong demand come from Kotlin community, right? You know, so they want to, um, um, uh, you know, Kotlin is one of the JVM languages that like look like Java and compare to the Java bytecode, but they also want to compile to Wasm. So, you know, so 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 they were the driving force behind the GC proposal to have a lightweight GC. In the um, in the in the Wasm runtime, but that's creates a problem. Is that do we have the GC turned on by default? If we turn on by default, then we can grow ever more complex. That it become as heavy as the JVM, right? You know, so we uh, we did this with a plugin as well. So you know, you can enable that feature on Wasm Edge by uh, installing that plugin and have that feature available to um, you know to the to the um, you know, specific programming languages that you want to target, right? And perhaps uh, with all those features, one of the um, results or one of the benefits is that uh, most of the common Rust or Go, even no JS libraries are now supported out of the box on Wasm Edge. So, for instance, uh, if you use uh, uh, if you use the Tokyo framework in, in Rust, or you use say a Hyper framework to start a server, or you use Request West to you know, all those are anonymous popular Rust crates, Rust libraries, and you can just compile them to Wasm, and they, they would run on Wasm Edge. You know, because we have, um, you know, um, um, you know the, the the capabilities of uh, asynchronous sockets and you know things like that, and uh, um, um, so that's um, that's the um, um, the the feature related to the runtime itself. And then another really big set of features are how the runtime is being managed. Right? We say we are a cloud native runtime. What does that even mean? You know, to me that means. The runtime itself, or the or the workload, can be managed by existing container tools. You know, so the way it works is that you know we uh, build this partnership and through the CNCF um, a community. We build this partnership with uh, companies like Docker, like uh, Red Hat, like uh, a project like Container D. You know, over those years, so that they can um, to expand the capability of those tools to not only manage Linux containers but also manage Wasm workloads. So. Um, at a very high level, it works like this. So you have an application that's written in, say, Rust or Go or Kotlin or JavaScript, and uh, you build it into a Wasm file that's, uh, that's, that's going to run in, uh, in, a, in Wasm Edge or any other Wasm runtime, right? And then you upload this artifact into, say, an uh, uh, artifact repository like Docker Hub. Um, but instead of saying this is targeted for, the architecture is targeted for x86 or ARM, because it's neither, it's a Wasm bytecode. It doesn't run on those CPUs. You treat Wasm like a CPU format, okay? So you basically label this artifact to say the artifact is Wasm32, you know, meaning it's 32-bit Wasm uh, uh, binary. And uh, so when Kubernetes, either container D or C run, or you know, um, um, one of the layers in, in Kubernetes goes into the container repository and fetch this artifact. It would know that it's not targeted towards one of the physical CPUs, but targeted through the Wasm CPU. So at that time, it's going to bypass the Linux container bootstrap procedure and start and start using a runtime like Wasm Edge or Wasm Time or you know, or other cloud native Wasm runtime to run it. Right? You know. So we have been uh, quite successful in. In this area, so the article on the right is a uh, is article we just published, you know, published on uh, uh, March 12th, you know, about you know WebAssembly on Kubernetes from a contain, uh, you know, uh, from containers to Wasm, right? You know, so it's a two-part series. It's a very, um, you know, I believe it's so it's, it's written one by one. I didn't write it, so it's, so uh, one of our community members wrote it. 
uh, I believe it's a very comprehensive introduction of how um, 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 we can achieve, you know, Wasm can run side by side with Linux containers in the same Kubernetes cluster. And uh, by uh, working on some of the uh, lightweight tasks, so for instance, you know, if you look at Kubernetes today, every single little thing is a, is a Linux container. Like, you know, wait for something to happen in the Linux container, right? You know, that container has 50 megabytes or 100 megabytes. So why? Right, you know, or deployed eBPF agent. That requires a Linux container, right? You know, that's a, uh, so, you know, with Wasm, you can do a lot of those things. You know, that's uh, small things that, uh, you know, happens, you start and, and, uh, and, and uh, once it's done, it gets shut down, you know, so it's more like a serverless or like a microservice type of approach, right? You know, so we are really proud in, uh, in, uh, in, in the collaboration we have, um, you know, we were able to do with, uh, with, uh, with the ecosystem projects. But, you know, that's, uh, um, so, um, but one thing I really want to emphasize, you know, uh, outside of all this, um, um, you know, um, uh, cloud native features or container features is um, uh, uh, what I believe a very significant use case for Wasm today. You know, um, uh, in, uh, in early in my talk, I talked about, you know, how people always ask, what's the killer application for Wasm, you know? So I think now we know, because in the past year, we have seen more adoption in Wasm than the past four years combined. You know, why? Because Wasm solves a problem that hasn't existed in, in our space for 20 years since Java came along. You know, so I remember when Java came along, people also asked, what problem does it solve? You know, it, because there's a framework like C, C++ that can write, you know, the, the server called Apache is because the server's name is Apacheable Server, right? You know, it's that you can use C to write, um, you know, Apache extensions and applications. You can, if you don't want that, you can use Perl, right? You know, that's, why do you need a new, new language for it? The, problem it solves are two folds at the time, 20 years ago, are two folds. One is that it's lighter than Perl. So it's, fast, so it's faster and doesn't have uh, so much baggage, but it's more portable than C. So that goes to write one from anywhere. So that allows developers to write application on their laptop and deploy it on the server without knowing the exact CPU type of the server, right? You know, so Java essentially solved that problem. That problem, we solved, we solved that problem with Java and then with Docker, with containers, with all that. But with the uh, uh, rise of AI and the uh, GPUs, this problem has come back with vengeance because we don't have a solution that can go across GPUs. If you look at, um, you know, even say, let's say NVIDIA GPUs, the CUDA 11 is incompatible with CUDA 12. It's incompatible with Tensor RT. And on the Mac, you have the different versions of Metal Framework. And then there's a new framework, MLX. And uh, those are same hardware, just different software, okay? And then you have different hardware, you know, the, in, the, in the ARM ecosystem. There's NPUs, there's all kinds of different processors coming from different vendors. And then each cloud provider, AWS has one, Azure has one, has their own AI inference hardware and with associated driver. So it is now very far from guaranteed that if I compile an application on my laptop, on my Mac laptop, I can somehow ship it and run it in the cloud. It's in fact, there's zero chance I would be able to do that, right? You know, so this, this portability problem has really come back, you know, because uh, if you think about it, Kubernetes is not designed to recompile or even retest application before deployment. It's just designed to orchestrate and manage binary artifacts. So we need a new binary format that can go across the entire cluster from the local device to edge to the cloud and then to, you know, whatever the other devices that's, that, that may exist in that cluster, right, you know. So, um, and run the exact same binary application all the way, you know. So, um, and Wasm provides a potential way. And in fact, I think Wasm is the only way in the market that can do that. So thanks to a spec that called WASIN, which Brooks has also mentioned, you know, that's uh, when WASIN first came out three years ago, Intel was the, mo uh, the, the most important driver behind it. And uh, most people, didn't really think much about it. You know, why do you want to do AI in Watson? You know, that's, isn't that what you should do with Python? You know, that's uh, so, you know, um, but now with all those problems of you know, bringing machine learning workload to, to the cloud and to production, you know, there's, um, with this problem coming back, Watson becomes a really good uh, abstraction layer. So now Watson is part of the component model spec proposal as well. So for developers, you only need to write and compile your application to Watson. There's no need to worry about CUDA. There's no worry, no need to worry about uh, the metal framework or any of the um, you know um, hundred different 
um, um, GPU drivers that you may or may not have on your, on your computer, on your development computer, right? You write WASI NN and you ship the WASI NN binary. And then on the target machine, if you have the WASM runtime installed properly, it would be able to translate and dispatch your WASI NN calls to the correct native calls that are available on that machine. So be it CUDA 11, CUDA 12, you know, whatever it is, right? You know, so it is a very, um, I think it is a very nice solution that abstract away all the uh, different hardware that's, uh, that may exist in the cluster, right? You know, so that's why we say it's a, it's a new generation of um, right once, wrong anywhere, but for GPUs, right? So, um, and because of that, it's, uh, um, we, can, um, we can build a whole uh, dev uh, application developer platform based on, based on WASM, right? You know, that's uh, uh, to have, um, you know, uh, nice APIs for developers to extend and to write their own applications. This is one of the things that um, I would hope to, um, you know, uh, to cover as part of the, the workshop. So, Brooks. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, I'd love to take just a minute or two to talk about Wasm Cloud and, and what Wasm Cloud looks like as a platform, and then I'd love to transition into y'all actually getting to write uh, some some WebAssembly on your your laptop. So, let's go through Wasm Cloud. It is an application platform. It also comes with a WebAssembly orchestrator. We focus on declarative deployments, no matter what cloud, edge, or computer you actually want to run on. We integrate very, very well with the existing cloud native standards. So we use uh, OCI, Open Container Initiative, to distribute all of our WebAssembly binaries. So you can just push it to a registry. We use the Open Application Model standard for our declarative manifests. It kind of looks like a Kubernetes deployment. We're completely OTEL observable. So logging traces uh, metrics. We got all of that in the, in the platform. And we package everything as cloud events. Just uh, really want to nail in home that we're really into the WebAssembly standards, supporting that as a platform, and very into the cloud native existing practices and standards that work really well, or at least solidly well today. Uh, Wasm Cloud comes with a set of standard interfaces, but it's extensible at runtime. And we use NATS, which is another CNCF project, as our networking layer. So with that comes automatic load balancing, failover, and RPC for your applications. Now we are approaching 1.0, which is really exciting. Uh, and we are soon to be incubating in the CNCF. So Wasm Cloud is growing really, really well as a project. We've got a growing set of uh, large and, and growing uh, contributor community. So all of you folks who are looking to contribute to cloud native projects, please uh, check us out. Everything is open source, uh, of course. So you're, you're welcome to. Uh, we, we love having more contributors. And we're getting a really nice set of growing industry adoption, which you could see if you watch the presentations that are actually up on YouTube now from Wasm Day yesterday. We had a few different companies from different uh, industries talk about their real use cases. So I think that uh, will really, uh, really help lend to uh, the, how the project is going. All right, folks, who's ready to write their first WebAssembly component? Nice. Everybody's whelmed. I'll, I'll take that for now. So this is going to be based on WASI.2. So you're going to use the standard HTTP interface in order to write this small application. And then we're going to run it using WASM time, which is the Bytecode Alliance's WebAssembly runtime. So we're going to get started. I, I want to, everybody uh, feel free to scan the QR code. I realized after the fact that Computers don't really scan QR codes, so the link is down at the bottom. Uh, it is github.com slash cosmonic labs uh, uh, slash kubecon 2024 EU WASM workshop. I'll leave this up for a second as I give a spiel so everybody can. Is, if, is everybody able to see that okay? Sorry, I can't see you folks. Just raise your hand if you're having trouble getting to the actual link, and, and we'll have people come around. What we're going to be doing during this tutorial is, is installing Rust and WebAssembly tools, building an HTTP component, uh, component that's written in Rust. You don't actually have to write any code. It's already, it's already there, so you can just look at it. Um, and then we're going to run the component with Wasm time. Now, I want to emphasize, because I talked about this a little bit earlier, that Rust has really great WebAssembly support. And that's awesome. And I know that not everybody is a Rust programmer or wants to learn Rust. And so this very first example is very rusty. 
But the example that I'll do uh, uh, afterwards, you actually get to pick your language between Rust, Go, JavaScript, and Python. So everybody is welcome to, to pick their thing. I just want to start from a common base. All right, please raise your hand if you need a little more time on the link. Otherwise, I will go look at it. OK, uh, so everybody, I'm sure you will have a, uh, a second to actually install uh, those tools. Um, but for now, uh, well, I guess you can keep looking at it. Everybody may, may take a second to install those tools, uh, but what I'm going to do is run through the same uh, tutorial as you, and uh, folks are welcome to kind of follow along at their own pace. So this repository has some instructions. So this will actually, I mean, you honestly don't even need me. You can just go through the readme on your own. I'm just here. So let me, uh, let me soothe you as you go through this uh, tutorial. So we're going, to, uh, we're going to talk through this first example. And uh, I, want to, uh, I want to give a, a big thanks to Dan Goman, uh, AKA Sunfish Code, who set up the example that we're going to clone and, and run today. It's a, it's a great WASI HTTP example. And to start, uh, you can either install these Rust things locally on your machine, or uh, you're welcome to just run this in a Docker container if, if you prefer not to you know, install some more stuff locally. And, and that's all fine. Just make sure to just to take a look at those instructions for, for some libraries you might need. All right, so first step, uh, we're doing this for real. So we're going to clone the, why? Oh, I copied the whole thing. This is real. Uh, we're going to clone the repository locally as hello wazi HTTP. And why don't we go ahead and take a look at some of the things that we're going to need in order to understand how we're building WebAssembly components. So I talked a little bit about WIT. I'll make sure to zoom in a good bit here. Talked about WIT. Let's look at the WIT. So this WIT, this is the set of interfaces that this component is going to use. And what this includes is all of the interfaces from the WASI HTTP proxy. Uh, the, the keyword there is world, but you can just think of it kind of like your component in this case. So it's all the things that this component is going to use. Now, if we take a look at the WASI HTTP proxy world, uh, the, the really interesting bit is over here in the handler. Uh, I'm sorry, I guess my auto or my, my formatting is not showing up. But this WASI HTTP proxy uh, handler includes one function called handle that receives an HTTP request, and then you can write an HTTP response back. That's a pretty uh, generic representation of an HTTP server. And that, that is the kind of level of interface that uh, the WASI standard is, is working at. So you receive an HTTP request, and then you can return one. Great. So that defines everything this component is going to do. You know just by looking at this world that this component's never going to reach out to the file system or make a network request of its own. It's, it's really, uh, uh, this is something that you can look at if you know the source code, um, but we'll talk about how to know about it if you don't know the source code in a minute. So in this project, you can simply build this by running cargo component build. And this will generate those bindings from the interface and then build a component. So if we use the WASM tools CLI, we can take a look at a component's width with component width and look at the WASM32 uh, in the target directory, the WASM32 WASI folder, and it is hello WASI HTTP. Now, this is kind of similar to the width that we just looked at, but it's kind of expanded and uh, really laid out in fine grain exactly what this component is going to do, which may interact with our standard in, standard out pipes like a normal program. Uh, it's going to export WASI HTTP incoming handler, but that's it. You know if you have this component. Imagine if this was untrusted code and you, you had no idea what was inside of it. You can actually take this and run it and know that it's never going to, like, pull a file from your system, which is, which is really sweet. Now, I can talk about the code uh, in a bit, but I think it's more fun if we run it. So we can use the uh, engine wasm time to execute this component, and we can use the serve command in order to do that. This is kind of like uh, uh, my JavaScript background is failing me, like node serve, like isn't there a serve project or whatever, you serve a thing. You know, something like that. You can serve this component, which implements HTTP. 
So if we do target debug wasm debug wasm. We're serving this hello world component on port 8080, and we can curl this hello world component on 8080. Hello wasi HTTP proxy world. So for all of you who are following along, uh, you may be uh, just a bit behind me, depending on what kind of tools you want to do install, if you did any container, things like that. But you uh, can now run your first WebAssembly component. If we want to take a look at the code, maybe to do a little modification of our own, we can take a look in source and lib.rs. And if you're not a Rust station, if you haven't written Rust code before, uh, don't fret. It works pretty similarly in every language because it's a standard interface. So we have a single function called handle here. And all we do as soon as we get a request is we just construct a new request to send back to whoever called it. And we write some string to it. So we can say something like hello kubecon workshop. Yay. Now if we write that and we run cargo component build, we get that new component. We can serve it the same way we did before. And you may not be surprised to know that if you curl it, you get the new string that you wrote, which is amazing. Everybody's written and, and done a hello world like this before. I think it's really important to start from the standard set of interfaces. Get this hello world. And then you can kind of build from there. There's plenty more information in this readme, so I would encourage you to take a look even past, uh, even past what we do today in the workshop. But I wanted to call out specifically, like if you're looking at that code and thinking, man, like I don't really want to write Rust, like uh, what is this like handler, like a request? There are some really cool tools coming out now that we have standards to build on, like Wasm HTTP tools, which is uh, a project that takes open API specifications like Swagger and generates them from wit or to wit so that you can basically take this uh, an existing open API kind of schema that you have and turn it into a component. So you can kind of generate all that code and then work straight from that business logic, which is really, really nice. Okay, so with that, everybody has kind of written their first component and run it with Wasm time. Uh, there is definitely more to come, but I want to make sure that I can pass it back to uh, Michael to present the, uh, the to present uh, kind of leveling that up. So not just using HTTP, but really doing some cool things with Wasm. So it's this one. I think I have to turn on the mirroring. Did it work? No. Oh, so which one? <laughs> Hey folks, I want to make sure that Michael, uh, hey, you don't feel too, uh, you're like you're good with getting set up. I know that we just hit you with a lot of information. I was wondering if folks had questions that they wanted to uh, go over. Yeah, I think there's a mic actually right over there. You're welcome to um, welcome to go to it. Doesn't have to be about the demo or anything specifically. It can be on all of it. Uh, thank you for the presentation first. Um, question about uh, the memory management, like. If I'm building an application in C or C++ and I am a bad developer, which is the case, and I'm um, doing things that are not supposed to be done with the memory, um, is there any protection provided by the, the WASM runtime? Yeah, that's a great question. So when you're running your WebAssembly component, I mean, you can do nasty things still within your own little slice of linear memory. Like if you have your own memory and you try to go out of bounds on a VEC that you have or something, then more power to you. Your, your WebAssembly component will panic and, and explode. But WebAssembly does get its own isolated slice of memory within the WASM runtime. 
And this is one of the reasons why uh, the, the runtime is a key piece of this because it does protect from those types of memory attacks. Because you have your own slice of memory, you can't, uh, it, it must not be able to, you know, overrun access of their memory and other components that are running in the runtime, et cetera. So you do get an enhanced level of security there. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, I would recommend checking out the WASM time uh, security audit that they did before 1.0, which I uh, talked a lot about, it, but a, a lot about that. All right. Um, a quick question, hopefully. Uh, you said that a lot of Rust crates can already compile to WebAssembly, like Tokyo and Hypo were two of the examples you gave. But in the interface, uh, I didn't have the uh, time to look at the code properly, but I did not see Hypo being used or Tokyo being used. So there is still a difference between them, or how do they interact? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So depending on the library, uh, before WASI 0.2, different libraries had support for compiling to WebAssembly using sockets, you, you know, opening, opening and, and making use of sockets. I'm sure Michael could talk about that as well because I, I believe they just implemented that. Now that we have a standard HTTP interface, that actually lays the foundation for all of these libraries to implement the HTTP functionality in, in a standard way. So the idea, it, it just came out, you know, a few months ago. So the idea is that the component model support lands in Tokyo or Hyper or Warp or, or pick your language framework of choice. And then you, instead of writing in terms of the interface, you write a Tokyo application that listens on a port and serves a request. And that under the hood is using the WASI standard API. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, perfectly. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, I think you're set up. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. All right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's great questions, you know, but that's, um, it's, a, it's a great, um, <clears throat> I think, opportunity to represent um, Wasm Edge's effort in this, um, in this uh, standardization effort, right? You know, so um, because a component model is, uh, is going to be an industry-wide standard, and it's going to be supported by, um, uh, you know, uh, application libraries downstream. And uh, so um, we should have not just one runtime implement that. You know, that's because most of the work is done um, within the uh, uh, within the bicycle alliance and the Wasm Time team. And uh, uh, Wasm Edge and the CNCF is uh, is our organization that that supports this effort, right? You know, so we are um, um, looking for their. Uh, specs and implement their specs in our in our runtime as well. So you know we are committed to become the um, you know uh, uh, to become one of the implementations that make it a truly a standard, right? You know. So uh, the code I show here and the link, which um, you can run yourself, is not as nice as the um, the demo um, Brooks has j uh, just demoed, but it's a uh, it's another way of HTTP. You know, uh, he demoed serving a HTTP page, right? You know. But in this demo, we are, so, uh, we are, we are demoing fetching a HTTP page through the same uh, component model interface, right? You know, so, so that's, uh, if you're interested, you can have a look, but it's still a little rough on the edges, so you can see the code I, I have is the WebAssembly format instead of the, the raw Rust code because, you know, there are some, uh, some ABI issues that we still have to, uh, we have to support. But, you know, so then goes on to the, um, to the main, um, you know, um, um, uh, tutorials that I have for the, for the workshop is to help you build a, a cross-platform large language model application that runs on your own device, right? You know, so um, I should be very cautious about this whole thing because the last time I did it in a, in a large conference like that, it's immediately crashed the entire conference Wi-Fi, you know, because the large language model is like uh, each of them is five gigabytes, although Wasm is very small. But the models are big, so it's like the, everyone downloading a full-size movie, you know. So the um, you know I end up not being able to get on my on the network myself, you know. That's <laughs> so not able to do the demo at all. But you know, um, so I have all the instructions of the demo in the in the in the QR code. It's uh, again, it's a, re, uh, it's a it's a GitHub repository. So uh, what I would like to show you is I would like to do the demo uh, do the uh, walkthrough here. And uh, if you like, if you want to follow along, that you are more than welcome. But I think it's more likely that you would, uh, you would uh, uh, go back to your hotel and do that at your leisure time and have a large language model running on your own device in no time, right? You know, so let's go to the, um, 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, crash your hotel's yeah. Wi-Fi. Don't crash this Wi-Fi. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's, uh, you know, there's, uh, um, you know, people download movies on their hotel Wi-Fi. You know, that's no big deal. You know, that's, uh, um, so we have an um, um, a installation script, a one-line script that is available in that uh, GitHub repository. It's called the Llama Edge script. You know, so we have Wasm Edge, and Llama Edge is the portable application we build for AI inference on top of uh, Wasm Edge. So all you need to do is to run it. You run it on Windows, Linux, Mac. I'm running it on a Mac here, right? You know, so what it does is that it installs Wasm Edge first, although it's, I'm not even downloading the, the, um, the large language model, but it's gonna take, um, I think, a minute or two to, um, to install not only just the Wasm Edge, but also the plugins. That um, you know, I, I talk about Wasm Edge has a plugin architecture. That's uh, all the un unnecessary features or you know optional features uh, available as plugins, right? You know, so large language model inference is definitely not one of the you know uh, core Wasm features that we have to include with every distribution of this runtime, right? So you know, so what we do is that we put it, uh, we make it available as a as a plugin. So you know, it's gonna um, let's wait. Um, a little so that it's um, it gonna download the whole thing and um, um, install the runtime. And the runtime is about 20 megabytes, you know. So I want to compare this, you know, when people say, okay, you know, that's um, how, uh, you know, is 20 megabytes big or small? If you try to run this large language model with PyTorch, um, guess what is the Docker image size of PyTorch itself without the model? It's four gigabytes four gigabytes of applications without even the, without even touching the model, right, you know. So you can imagine if you want to run it in a car, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, you know, that's, um, it would, um, um, it would be, um, the cost would be astronomical, right, you know. So now it has downloaded all the, um, downloaded and installed Wasm Edge, and it's very easy, as you can see, and it's skipped over downloading the large language model because it says, you know, um, uh, it's, um, uh, because it already have it. Now it has, actually has already started, but I want to scroll back to see what it did, right, you know. So here, you can see it's downloaded the large language model, but it doesn't, because it's a couple gigabytes, so it's uh, skipped over. You know, this is a um, uh, Gamma 2B model, which, um, which released, was released by Google, uh, um, you know, like last week. And this is downloading the Wasm application. So this Wasm application, use our socket API and use our large language model inference API. So we build those API functions into the, uh, the Wasm application. The Wasm application itself is only two, uh, two, uh, is only two megabytes. And uh, it can run on any device that has Wasm Edge installed. So I can run on Raspberry Pi, I can run on my local Mac, and uh, I can run on everywhere. So, you know, as you can see here, it's, uh, um, it runs and start a server like Brooks did, right? You know, there's a, um, we, we start an HTTP server and start serving it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off my Wi-Fi. So to make sure you see it, that this whole thing runs on the local computer, not on any sort of, you know, open AI API. You know, I'm not cheating in any way. Local host, 8080. It serves a HTTP page right from the, so, you know, so that's what I said, you know. One of the things you can do with Wasm, you can start an HTTP server in it. And it's an asynchronous server, so it can handle multiple concurrent connections, right? So it shows you the, the library and, you know, things like that. So I'm going to ask, what's, what is the capital of France? Okay. We all know that, but we, let's see if the computer knows that. So what this does is that it's, uh, by the way, my Wi-Fi is turned off, right? Okay, so this whole thing runs on this MacBook without even external um, a power source, right? You know, so it runs entirely on, uh, on its battery. So it says the capital of France is Paris. It's a political, economic, and cultural center of the country. What about Japan? So you can see it follows the conversation, you know. What do you mean, what about Japan? If I ask what about Japan, the first question, you would have no idea what I'm asking, right? But since I already asked what's the capital of France, it knows I must be referring to what is the capital of Japan, right? So it tells me the capital of Japan is Tokyo. You can ask a longer question, you know, plan me a one day trip to Paris. 
So it goes back to Paris. It's gonna start to do those things, you know, start at Eiffel Tower with the view and whatever. You know, it's gonna go on for a while. And uh, uh, sometimes it's not really right, you know, because it's only a two, um, two billion parameter model. So it's, uh, it's uh, in, in an in a age of large language model, it's definitely a very small one. But as you can see, it's, uh, it's already spinning out words that faster than I can speak, right? You know, so even on the, um, that's demonstrate it's not only just running on the CPU, it's, it's running on the GPU. What I haven't demonstrated here really is that um, I can take the same uh, WASM file and uh, uh, use SCP or use a, a flash, uh, flash drive to copy it to another machine that has the NVIDIA GPU. It would run the, at, the same, at a similar speed with the, the exact same application would run the same way, right? You know, so it's, uh, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's pretty long, right? You know, that's, uh, um, so this is um, one of the demos. Um, the first demo I want to show you, you know, is that you have a WASM application and then, you know, you have, you can, you can, um, you can start an API server. That's because the API server is, uh, I'm only showing you the, the web interface here, but you can also use the, uh, the API endpoints, which I can show you in another demo. So, you know, um, you can have all the OpenAI tools available to work with this API server, you know, because a lot of tools assume it's connect to an OpenAI backend, right? You know, this server on your local host can act as that OpenAI backend. So, but as we also mentioned, the power of WASM is not just to, to stand up, say, uh, uh, API server, because a lot of people, a lot of tools can stand up API servers, right? You know, there's, um, I can think of quite a few. The, the power of WASM really is the application development platform. So it can allow you to add features into the API server that is not available, that is, um, that is addressing your own needs, right, you know. So for, for in this specific case, I want to show you a quick demo of another one that is, um, let me control C out of this, uh, stop this server. And uh, what's in the, in the large language jargon is called the REG server. Uh, what is the REG server? It means I not only have the large language model and the inference, but I also have a vector database and so have some external uh, knowledge source that injected into the vector database so that when I ask the model some kind of a question, it's gonna go to the vector database and search for answer first, and then give that answer as context to the large language model so that the large language model can, act, can answer with better accuracy, right? You know, so, so this is, um, you know, one of the, uh, you know, as you can see, there's a lot of interactions, and uh, um, before we have this, um, um, you know, if we don't do that in Rust and Wasm, we can do it in Python. That's where tools like LineChain and, uh, you know, Llama Index and, you know, things like that uh, come into play, right? You know, so they would just, uh, um, you know, um, uh, 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 um, ask you to stand up API server and then use Python to, to do things that's outside of it. But the problem is that you have multiple Docker images multiple Python installations, and uh, each of them needs to be managed very explicitly, and then you would have very complex interactions between the model and the problem, and you know, the, the, the data that you generate from the model and all that stuff, right? So, you know, um, so with WASM, um, we can write everything into a single application that is written in Rust or written in JavaScript, and then compile that into, into, um, into WASM and have it, um, you know, within that, within that Rust application to connect to the other sources. Um, you know, this is, uh, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it says it's recovering the um, um, collections snapshot, meaning that's, you know, I have an external uh, knowledge source that's about, you know, that knowledge source is about tourism in Paris. So I put that, um, I took a database snapshot and then uh, asked it to recover. Oh, okay, it's good. So, you know, let's see, fingers crossed to see if it's gonna finish. Oh, okay, so it installs uh, FRP. Hopefully that goes fast as well, so it's one third. So as you can see, there's multiple tools the WASM application has to interact with so that to perform the complex orchestration of, um, you know, um, generating the palm, generating, uh, searching the database and all that stuff, right? So now it's finished. It's finished installing and I use another script to start it. Start, start sh. So as you can see, it starts the vector database first with the snapshot we gave it and then start WASM Edge with the large language model. What did it kill? Okay, so I think it's fine. You know, that's, uh, um, so it's, uh, then it's start a server. The server is 
not the API server we just wrote, we just show. It's another API server. Um, by the way, all the source code is available. You know, that's, um, that's connects to the vector database before each query, right? So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to um, show you um, the, log, the log file so that we can see exactly what's going on with those. Um, start log dot txt. I think that's what it is. Yeah, so the server starts, right? So I come back here, and uh, um, I'm going to uh, load the local, local web page all over again. And I can turn off my Wi-Fi here, but I don't have to, you know. So I turn off this. So here, it shows that it's now using a different model. It's using uh, the Llama 2 model. Instead of the Gamma 2B model, it's now a 7B model. So if I ask a question like, uh, um, where is Paris? Okay, so I ask a question about Paris again. What it does is that it's going to search the vector database to find Paris tourism guides and then use that as context to answer that question. I bet I can show, I, I can see that in the log already. So, you know, so if you, if you see in the log, you see, I asked the, the, the single question, where is Paris? But the prompt that actually gives the LM is actually this three paragraph of text. Those are the, uh, what is search result from the vector database. Again, all of them is done using, Wasm, using a Rust application that is compiled to Wasm. It searches the database, constructs this, 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 uh, this prompt, and then send it to the um, uh, uh, LM and for answer. So it's very clearly say, based on the provided context, Paris is located in this part of France, seated along the river, right? You know, according to the text, the people live here for so long and so long, and, and, and you know, things like that. So, you know, um, I would uh, um, really encourage you to do those demo where, you know, where you are in the hotel, you know, that's, uh, because I think it's, I'm just uh, showing some very simple examples of chatting with that. Um, a far more interesting case for all of us is to have it write programs, you know, today, we have a lot of Python, as you can imagine, a lot of the works that we do is to take those little Python programs and translate them into Rust, you know, so that we can run those applications. I do none of this manually these days. I do all of, the, I ask the large language model to translate all of them. So when, whenever I see a Python program to pre-process data or tokenize the data, you know, something like that, I say, I need this in Rust so that I can build into my application server. I feed that into Code Llama and ask it to translate it for me. And, uh, you know, six out of 10 times, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna just run, you know, it's gonna just compile and run. And sometimes it has, it needs some manual fix and, you know, things like that. So it's, uh, it, it is a really uh, very interesting uh, uh, productivity tool. So that's, um, um, I think that's my, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, okay, let me, that's my demo, and I think, uh, so yeah, there's, if you are interested in the code, like I said, everything is open source, and the basic inference code can be fed into one screen. It's less than 100 lines of code with WASI uh, as, a, as a target, you know. So we compile this code, and then we, we um, you know, we can copy it into WASM, and we can copy it around into anywhere that's, um, that's, that's the WASM runtime is installed, WASM edge is installed. So I'm going to come back and uh, send it back to Brooks to demonstrate some really interesting features about distributed components with WASM Cloud now. Just let's see if I can plug in a cord and talk at the same time. Uh, just so you folks know, I did put the, all of these slides up on the um, schedule ske sched page. So if any of you folks want to actually uh, take a look at some of the codes, some of the contents, uh, you all should be able to uh, should be able to find it there. So so all available. Not that. All right, uh, so for the second, uh, or for the, for the third tutorial that you all will see today, what I really want to go through uh, is uh, kind of extending that Hello World tutorial that I touched on before uh, with logging, key value, uh, and start to take a look at what it looks like to take a component and distribute it across different environments, run the same component in different environments, uh, and do that using Wasm Cloud. So for folks who want to follow along with this demo, now is the time that you get to do your Rust or Python or TypeScript or Go. 
Uh, I'm going to use Go, because I assume that the most amount of people have used that out of all of the things. Uh, but it all works the same. All the code works pretty much uh, identical. So I would recommend just if you go, you can follow the same steps as me. If you go to wasmcloud.com and take a look at our documentation, uh, I would recommend or, or you all should go through the installation part first, which is just getting uh, WASH, which is the Wasm Cloud shell. We're big on our puns. But what I want to actually run through is the uh, quick start. So this is going to have a very similar beginning to the uh, HTTP Hello World component. Uh, it's just going to be through Wasm Cloud tooling, which is uh, by and large compatible or is, is, is compatible with the standard. So the first thing that we'll do to launch our local infrastructure is run wash up. Very similar to uh, Docker Compose up kind of scenario, we launch our NAT server to handle our networking, and we launch Wasm Cloud. Again, this is just a binary that runs on your local laptop, so it doesn't matter if you all are running Linux or Mac or Windows, it, it all works. I mean, it, that is a different binary, but it all works the same. So what we can do first, like I said, I'm going to use Go, and this is annotated uh, tiny Go just because of the compiler, but we'll, we'll keep going through there. I'm going to generate my new project, which is just kind of a, it's just a hello world component. It's actually almost exactly the same code that you saw before, just of course going to be in uh, Go rather than in Rust. So if we take a look at this, uh, take a look at this component, I'll just open up in VS Code to, to keep it easy. Oh, not there. Take a look at hello. We can see it has this one Go file here, and that should be large enough. Please let me know if you can't see it well. But what this one file here has is a handle. It's the same function signature because it's the same interface that Rust was using. And what we do is set up a new HTTP request, and we drop hello from Go. Now, the question earlier that came through about uh, Rust libraries, the same thing applies for Go. We're actually working on contributing the component model standard up to uh, regular Go, and that should be slated to release in the next August release of, of Go, which is, which is super exciting. So in order to build this, similar to cargo component build, you can just run wash build. And this will delegate out to, to Go to uh, compile this component. And we can take a look at this component, just like we did before with Wasm Tools component wit. We'll see that it had a couple of new things come in, but the uh, important thing here is that we have the same export, Wasi HTTP incoming handler. And we can actually use Wasm time to serve this component. So if we run Wasm time serve as common, build and then our HTTP hello world. I'll use multiple terminals. We can curl this. So this was a project that we generated and we built uh, using WASH, but it just works in the standard runtime. <coughs> now, what I want to take you through next is taking this beyond HTTP. I want to add some persistent storage, and I want to add uh, some uh, additional uh, logic to this application. So I ran through a couple of the steps in this quick start here. So you all should be able to uh, kind of follow along. Uh, I know that we're kind of near the end of the workshop here, so you can follow along at a more uh, condensed or your own pace uh, at home. But I want to go ahead and instead of running this in uh, Wasm time, I want to launch this in Wasm Cloud. So what we can do here, we have our declarative manifest, which makes up an application which is just the local WebAssembly component uh, annotated here as a component called Hello World. And then we have one uh, capability. This is an implementation of an interface. It's our actual HTTP server that we're going to run. So we'll go ahead and deploy this application. And if we take a look at our app, we'll see that it's reconciling. It's going to download some things and then deploy. And now if we call localhost 8080, Oh, where is that? Uh, wash. If we take a look at this actual application, we can see that HTTP Hello World is running. Let me make sure that's there. Uh -huh. Give me one moment. Hmm. 
I had some leftover things from my previous uh, previous things of demo, which is pretty fun. Okay, that will work fine. We're gonna go ahead and uh, delete that and deploy it again. We already running that? Give me just a moment. Aha. So we're running the tiny go version. Okay, so we can check out that uh, component that's running again, see if there's anything running, and we can deploy that manifest again. This is what you get for trying to do the demo kind of at the, the last minute at the end of the workshop. Hmm. Well, we'll give that a moment just to go ahead and spin up. What I really wanted to talk about uh, as we get to the end is when you deploy this application, the kind of next step is, of course, as you're going to go on, you're gonna want to do more than just handle an HTTP request. And so this uh, part, adding functionality, is really all about taking the standard interfaces for HTTP and for key value and for logging and adding those into your application. And uh, the end of this just kind of walks you through taking this, uh, this last part, modifying the code, uh, making sure that you can build and update your component. And so I know that we are at the, uh, kind of in the last minute, and I really wanna make sure that I have enough time to answer your questions and, and go further. Of course, this is all on our documentation. I wanted to run through this live with you today. Um, but I think I'll just go ahead and pause here and, and uh, ask for, for any questions uh, about the workshop today. Hello. All right, folks. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for your nice workshop. Um, one question which came to my mind is um, support for garbage, collect, garbage collected languages or languages um, with dynamic typing. You said you have to bring your own garbage collector and configure it somehow as a plugin. Mm -hmm. How does that scale if I have a bunch of components? If I think about applications or package managers like NPM, where you boil in dozens of dependencies, how can I manage that at runtime? Yeah, so the WebAssembly, the, the proposal for garbage collection in WebAssembly is actually something that moves through the W3C, so it's, it's not just something that's handled on the server side, but it's in like the core WebAssembly specification. And that uh, proposal actually landed in the W3C, so it's kind of a, um, the, the runtime can provide an implementation of a, of a garbage collector. So if you do work on a garbage collected language, that does work. Now, I can't speak exactly to the internals of how it's gonna garbage collect for, for different languages, um, but I would highly recommend taking out, checking out that spec. The, the WASM GC is the you know, garbage collection, is the kind of working group and, and uh, but, body there. But in the end, that means um, I need dedicated WASM runtimes to support specific languages in the end. So it comes ju both from the, the WASM runtime, which is just supporting the core WebAssembly <coughs> spec, uh, and then also in the language, the source language itself, in order to put that logic there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, folks, I'm getting the angry caution don't be here anymore, sign. Uh, so thank you, uh, we're gonna hang out here for, for a minute as long as they uh, allow us to, but we'll also be uh, in the back as well. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I got one question. Uh, I didn't quite understand about the difference between Wasp Cloud and Wasp Edge, since eventually like we want to run on everything that can run on a Wasp, what is the difference between the two runtime? Like if I do an application with Wasp Cloud, yeah. could it be run only for things that support Wasp Cloud? Uh, 
Yeah, so that's the exact reason why we have standard interfaces. The idea is that you write an application, you can do it through Wasm Cloud and everything, but if your focus is to work on like uh, interfacing with LLMs, Wasm Edge is the runtime to do that with. So then you can just take your application to the runtime that implements what you need the best. Yeah, so um, maybe I can add to that as well. So I, I think our two projects, uh, what do we call our sister project, or browser project, so I think we are upstream and downstream. In the, in the Java jargon, you could see us, Wasm Edge as a JVM and Wasm Cloud as an application server, right? You know, so they have a lot more um, application facing stuff. We are more focused on the runtime itself. We, although we have application stuff uh, that's building, that, but you know, we are um, aim to be standard compliant, right? You know, so um, going forward, we want to be one of the runtimes that, uh, that runs underneath Wasm Cloud. You know, that's uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a upstream downstream relationship, I would say. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, folks, well, thank you all for, for coming today. I, I really hope that this was useful to learn about WebAssembly, actually get to run a thing, and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you all at the rest of the conference.